Welcome to Take Care, a weekly conversation on health and wellness produced by WRVO Public Media. I'm Lorraine Rath. And I'm Linda Lowen. When Star Trek debuted on TV in 1966, viewers marveled at the handheld communication device Captain Kirk used to talk to crewmates. Few imagined a similar flip-top device might become a reality in their lifetime. Today, 50 years later, over 4 billion cell phones are in use worldwide. The first commercially available one, released in 1983, was the size of a shoebox and cost just under $4,000. As prices dropped and size shrunk, cell phones became commonplace in the 1990s. Today, most of us can't live without them, but their use may pose a risk. Cell phone radiation exposure was a concern in the early days, but public fears were eased by early studies downplaying its impact. More recent research, however, raises those concerns once again. In May 2016, Scientific American published the article, Major Cell Phone Radiation Study Reignites Cancer Questions. Joining us to discuss the findings is the author of the article. Dana Fine Marin is an award-winning journalist and the health and medicine editor for Scientific American. She's also a contributor to the publication's podcasts and instant egghead video series. She joins us from her office in Washington, D.C. Thank you for coming on the show, Dina. We appreciate your time. Great to be here. Tell us about the study and its findings. Sure. So this study was conducted by federal scientists. They conducted a $25 million animal study to test possible links between cancer and chronic exposure to the type of radiation emitted from cell phones. Now, what's special about this study is it included an unprecedented number of rodents that were subjected to a lifetime of electromagnetic radiation starting in utero. That means before they were born. And the study presents the strongest evidence so far that such exposure is associated with the formation of rare cancers in at least two cell types in the brains and the hearts of rats. Some of the rats had glioma, which is a tumor of the glial cells in the brain, and other rats had an increased level of shawarma of the heart. That's tumors of the nerve sheath that grow slowly and push nerve fibers aside. Researchers found that as thousands of rats in this new study were exposed to greater intensities of this radiation, more of them developed these tumors. And these tumors could not be easily explained away because none of the control rats, those that weren't exposed to the radiation, developed the same tumors. What length of time were we talking about a daily exposure of these rats? Yeah, so this is a really high level of exposure. These rats were exposed nine hours a day to varying levels of radiation. So this was designed to emulate really intense radiation exposures when they were trying to roughly emulate what would happen with a human. This would be a human with very heavy cell phone use. So what form does this radiation take and how does it affect the body? This type of radiation is called non-ionizing radiation. It's produced from cell phones and other sources like radar and microwaves. There's currently no consistent evidence that non-ionizing radiation increases cancer risk. And the issue is we also don't know how it would go about causing cancer. We don't know what that mechanism of action would be. Most knowledge we have about these exposures comes from knowledge about really high levels of this radiation that would actually heat up cells. But that wasn't the case here. The temperatures, uh, these body temperatures of these animals remained in the normal range. So it's not that essentially these cells are being cooked and that causes a problem. We don't know exactly how it is causing this problem or potential problem. Why has it been so hard up until now to determine with certainty whether the radiation from cell phone use is harmful and potentially causes cancer? Because there have been studies along the way. There certainly have, yeah. Prior studies in animals and humans have really just given us some mixed results. There have been multiple studies in humans, certainly, including several very large-scale ones that have been well-known, but they depend on humans basically recalling their cell phone usage in the past, and that, of course, can be problematic. So you take some patients that have developed brain cancer and you ask them, do you remember uh, what your cell phone use was like in the last few decades, how many hours a day you used it, how you held your phone? Obviously, it's difficult to remember that sort of thing. 
And that's one of the reasons that this study was conducted. In 2011, a working group at the WHO, the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer, classified cell phone use as possibly carcinogenic to humans because of these mixed findings. Some studies had shown an increased risk of cancer. Some had said we can't find any increased risk of cancer. And so this $25 million animal study was supposed to help us really settle this matter to a greater extent. Extent. Alongside, there's also an ongoing study right now in Europe. It's a large perspective study in humans on the long-term health effects of these exposures, and it's designed to go for 20 or 30 years uh, following a large group of folks with questionnaires about their health, access to these people's health records, and careful study of their cell phone records throughout this time. And these two studies together, this animal study and that human study, are really designed to help us get some more answers. So what you're saying is that the prior studies really were anecdotal, not in a controlled setting. My question is, are all scientists and physicians on board that this $25 million animal study is once and for all conclusive? No, they aren't. There were some confusing findings that came out of this study. One of them was that there were some confusing findings as far as uh, mixed result with genders. One of the results was that more of these lesions were found in male rats than female rats, and also more lesions were found in the heart than in the brain. And those are two questions that, you know, will be continued to be ongoing. The, not, the federal scientists that conducted the study said they're going to be putting out other results about the work in rats next year and also findings about similar tests conducted in mice. One of the things that they did in this experiment was they put uh, these creatures, these mice and these rats, in specially built chambers that could dose the animals with varying amounts and types of radiation. But they were designed to... Uh, do the animal's entire body, expose the animal's entire body instead of just their heads to this radiation because people store their cell phones in their bras and their pants pockets and so on. Um, So they wanted to see the effects of this type of radiation throughout the bodily system. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Take Care, a conversation on health and wellness produced by WRVO Public Media. I'm Linda Lowen. I'm Lorraine Rapp. And we're talking with Dina fine Marin. She's an award-winning journalist and the health and medicine editor at Scientific American. She authored the article, Major Cell Phone Radiation Study Reignites Cancer Questions. So you mentioned that the rats were dosed so that they'd be dosed all over their body because for a long time people have said, well, I don't talk, you know, I don't, I don't talk on the cell phone. It's not right up to my ear. I may have it in my back pocket. I'm using headphones or earbuds or whatever and talking through a small device. So is it proximity to the brain or just simply having the device on or close to our bodies? So scientists that I've spoken with that really focus in this area, work in this area, say that your phone is always emitting some degree of radiation, whether you're utilizing it or not. It is an issue about uh, uh, proximity to yourself um, that's important here. So we can help protect ourselves by don't keep your phone in your bra or your pocket. During the day, put your phone on your desk. Use a headset with your cell phone when possible. Those are, you know, sort of precautionary steps we can take while the science remains somewhat unsettled in this area. Those are steps that have been recommended to me by scientists I interview and ones that I'm trying to take to heart as someone that spends a lot of time on the phone. Yes, I'm curious what changes you've made since you reported on this study. Well, uh, as you you referenced, there have been a lot of studies in this area in the past, and in advance of the science being somewhat inconclusive in this area, inconsistent, I've tried to take steps to use a headset anyway. But following these findings, I've certainly been more conscious of I try to put my cell phone further away from me on my desk when I go into work during the day, um, which is just a little step, but it's it's something important to do, I think. And um, the study also made me think more about since these rats were exposed starting in utero, that made me think about potential special vulnerabilities that a fetus might have. And I am not pregnant, but if I were, or uh, if I knew people that were, I might suggest you might want to keep your phone further away, perhaps not in your pocket, to provide some distance between your fetus and your phone. What about kids? Because as adults, I mean, I, I I didn't start using a cell phone until I was quite grown up. But we see kids younger and younger, and they're, I mean, they're living 24-7 with it. Is that, are kids more vulnerable? 
Yeah, so the National Cancer Institute has thought about that question a bit, and certainly there are theoretical considerations as to why this group might be particularly vulnerable. Their nervous systems are still developing, and they're more vulnerable to factors that may cause cancer. Obviously, their heads are smaller than those of adults, so from a dose perspective, they might have a greater proportional exposure to the radiation that is emitted by cell phones, and children obviously are earlier in their lives, so they have the potential of accumulating more years of cell phone exposure than an adult might. So those are all factors we have to think about, but there isn't any science yet that says uh, they are at greater risk, but logically does follow, as with many areas of exposure, that a kid, from a dose perspective, might be more vulnerable than an adult. So that's something to think about when making decisions about how your kid is using his or her phone. Dina Fine Marin is the author of Major Cell Phone Radiation Study Reignites Cancer Questions that was published in May 2016 in Scientific American, and she also is the editor of Health and Medicine at Scientific American. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with our listeners on Take Care. Thanks for having me.